gave this talk was right after uh, um, or right before St. Patrick's Day. So uh, the title "Luck of the Gardener" comes from that a little bit. Um, but also, it's it's really true with what we do. Um, you can plan everything, but um, if you're not lucky once in a while, then uh, um, it doesn't look quite as good as if you are. Um, so, but it's it's really focusing on uh, gardening in an urban environment. So a little bit about me, been with the city for two years, um, horticultural specialist. Um, some of my roles, uh, we do a lot within Parks and Rec. Um, so um, anything from annual and perennial design, um, annual and perennial maintenance, uh, natural areas management. Um, we work with uh, contractors and design firms on some of the new projects uh, going in around town. Um, collaborate with volunteers. Uh, we couldn't do most of what we do without volunteers. Um, so uh, they're a big help, especially in the downtown area. Um, and then I supervise the um, uh, seasonal horticulture workers and one full-time staff as well. Um, so my approach uh, is kind of how I uh, approach gardening, especially in the urban environment. And that top thing there, powerful perennials is uh, and the most important one. Um, I like to use perennials in my designs to uh, um, help with maintenance, um, uh, keep costs down, um, kind of all of the above. Um, and along with that, um, natives are, are a big part of that as well. Um, and then with natives and even some uh, non-natives, uh, pollinators are a big trend um, right now. So those are important and, uh, and something we focus on. And then this next thing, designing with diversity. Um, I'll get into it a little bit. I have a whole nother talk on that for a different time, but uh, um, uh, when we're looking at diversity, it's, it's really important, especially uh, with our trees around the city. Um, and then managing maintenance. Uh, we have a small crew. Um, it, uh, it's a challenge at times, but uh, if we design in, in a um, way where we're accounting for maintenance from the beginning, we can uh, um, make it easier on ourselves in the long run. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my planning um, uh, process uh, and kind of put planning in perspective and then uh, talk a little bit about some of the extra things we've been trying to do. And then of course, uh, uh, luck and, and other lessons come into that as well. So uh, can anyone guess uh, where this garden is located? I mean, it's beautiful, lush, uh, you got all this color, a bunch of perennials. Um, so you'd think it was, you know, um, some garden on beautiful topsoil and, and all that. Well, it's actually uh, downtown Chicago. It's on top of a parking ramp structure. It's actually a uh, Lori Garden downtown there in Millennium Park area, if you've been there. Um, so you can do a lot with perennials in a, a hostile environment. You've got, uh, you know, temperature swings below and above on this, and we all know Chicago's winters aren't, aren't the nicest. How about this garden? So uh, if you look in the uh, um, bottom left-hand corner there, you see a little bit of a old railroad track. Um, this is the, uh, the High Line in New York City. Um, so built on, on the old High Line rail ra railway system. Um, it's been wildly popular with tourists. Um, Turn this space that was, um, you know, weeds and other uh, um, uh, pioneer species uh, growing up on the on the tracks into a uh, um, a really nice uh, perennial uh, linear garden. I don't know how many miles it is, but it, it covers a pretty uh, long stretch. Um, so once again, you have the temperature swings below and above. You got drought. You've got wind. A little bit of everything. So those perennials are performing well. So the, then the next one, um, guess where this one is? This one's a little bit closer to home. This is uh, City Park. It's a parking lot bed. Um, it's essentially a parking lot island, kind of as you go into the, the park past uh, the Shakespeare Amphitheater and then, and then up before you make the, the corner when you're um, heading towards the river. Um, so this was planted last year with um, transplants and some other uh, some other perennials that we brought in with a few shrubs and uh, um, uh, large shrubs in the back as well. Um, so those should fill in. Um, we added some bulbs last fall too. So if you've been down there, there's daffodils blooming right now in the back section. Um, 
But once again, this is a hostile environment. You've got uh, heat off the parking lot, um, baking it. You've got uh, whatever else with uh, snow removal that gets um, thrown on it from sand to salt, a little bit of everything. But the perennials uh, in here are tough and, and they do their job. And um, the number of bees we saw last year down there was, was kind of amazing for, for new planting. So uh, I guess the next question is, what do uh, all these gardens have in common? Of course, we've talked about uh, perennials um, and uh, also the tough growing conditions, but they also um, have high returns uh, visually, um, aesthetically, and actually fairly low inputs. That last garden was uh, um, hardly any uh, cost to that for planting material. We transplanted things that would have been, uh, um, uh, I guess, tilled under with um, other projects um, going on around the city. So we're using what we have and moving it to a new place and, and kind of repurposing it. Um, and that's something special about uh, perennials. They're pretty tough. They, uh, they can take just about anything you throw at them. I know some daylilies can sit for a year and uh, without much soil around them. And then the next year, they'll still pop up. Um, and also with that, uh, low inputs. Um, very little in way of inputs, um, uh, a little bit of leaf mulch here and there um, to help the soil out. Um, most of our, our areas, we don't um, do much more than that when we uh, start them out. And those perennials actually do better than uh, the weeds need the rich soil to grow usually, um, whereas the, uh, these perennials, um, a lot of which grow in prairies, uh, um, don't need any of that. So they're just fine with, uh, um, with the soil and actually thrive in that, that instance. They also have one other thing in common, and it's a, a new style um, we're trying out around the city. Um, it's been termed new perennial design. A couple other things that sometimes goes by, but um, uh, prairie style is one of the older terms. Um, that was popularized by Jens Jensen in the Chicago area um, back in the early 1900s. Um, He's best known for the council ring concept, but he was, uh, um, his best contribution probably was bringing natives from the prairies, which were right outside of uh, downtown Chicago at that time into the parks and uh, bringing them to the people. And uh, they were then able to see how, you know, these, these plants that weren't from Europe and maybe hadn't been uh, thought of as um, these grand uh, plants for gardens before then were, were started. Um, he started to use them and then it caught on a little bit, but really in the last uh, 20 years, it's caught on quite a bit more. Um, so the Lori Garden in Chicago, which the photo was earlier, um, that's by Pete Adolf and he's, um, he's from Holland and he does a lot of this work. Um, so the top uh, left there is one of his designs in winter. And what's cool about this style is um, you leave the plants up all winter. They have some cool interest, like the frost you see there. Um, middle uh, image on top is um, from the Brenton Arboretum. Um, I believe one of the guys from the Des Moines Botanical Garden designed that for them. Um, bottom left, the small image is um, also in Chicago. That's by Roy Diblick. He's another uh, major player in this design style, and that's at the Shed Aquarium. Um, those were all plugs uh, when they went in, and uh, this is, I think, three or four years later, this photo, so the plants really grew in. Um, another image on the bottom of uh, City Park there from last year, and on the right, uh, just outside here, that's our median on Washington Street we planted last year. Um, similar style planting with the plugs and, and natives, and um, it's really starting to uh, um, come in this year, and it, hopefully it'll fill in even more throughout the season. Um, that's kind of an overview of the design style. Um, we'll be doing more projects um, this year with the style around City Hall here and across the street and then up at the, uh, the rec center as well. So keep an eye out for those. So a little bit about natives. Um, natives have become one of the uh, um, fastest growing segments of uh, um, design. Um, Probably 20 years ago, if you went to any of the box stores around, you wouldn't find too many natives. Now you have almost all of them to choose from and a few um, cultivars of each, it seems like. Um, but what makes natives so great is their uh, drought tolerance, um, as well as their zone appropriate. Um, you don't have to worry about them making it through the winter usually. 
Um, they have, uh, I'm going to call established community roles. Um, they, they co-mingle well together. Um, they, uh, they live in a, in a way where they're in competition, but at the same time, they're filling their niche and, and growing well. So if we um, mimic some of their uh, um, communities and placement in our, our designs, we're able to uh, create that, that same uh, benefit. And they also create habitat for uh, insects, uh, um, mammals, uh, uh, other, other little critters just about everywhere. So um, they're good in that way as well. And also the monarchs, which are the big uh, topic right now. But I don't want to leave the uh, non-natives out, um, what I'm going to call non-native allies. So there are a lot of non-natives that grow well with our natives, provide for pollinators. Uh, don't take over too much as well. Um, a lot of uh, the cultivars are um, bred not to reseed. Um, so the, uh, um, the allium up there on the right is uh, summer beauty allium, or actually that one might be millennium allium. They look similar, but uh, they, uh, they're one that the, the insects like to pollinate, and um, they also provide that pop of color and don't really take over when they're planted with uh, with natives. The other one there is catmint, and some catmints can start to move a bit, but um, what's great about the new perennial design style is if something moves too far, you can pull it up and not feel bad because something else is going to fill back in. So um, what you start with in a design can change over the years, and that's what, what makes it even more special. There's a little bit of uh, um, blue, st or, uh, blue star started um, in this photo too. It was just a plug at this photo is taking, or when this photo was taken, but uh, um, that's in the middle. It's a tall, um, thin one. Um, so that's another good one to use. So in providing for pollinators, uh, anyone guess what this plant is? It's, it's pretty common around, uh, yep, it's common milkweed. Do you know the uh, Latin name? <laughs> there you go, um, Asclepius syriaca, um, and it's a great plant for monarchs. Uh, however, um, if you plant it in your garden, it can really take over. Um, so we can we can do good by the monarchs in a couple other ways too. There are other milkweeds um, that are out there, um, like butterfly milkweed, which has a a really nice orange flower that might be a, a better substitute. Um, common milkweed gets really tall, and if you uh, if you really like it and want to keep it, then I'd suggest taking the the seed heads off, um, seed pods off um, before they all blow away. Your neighbors might thank you too. Um, but they also spread um, from their base, so um, they will move as they grow. Um, beautiful plant though when it's in bloom as well. Um, but there are other, like I say, other milkweeds you might want to go for. Yes? So does that look at calling butterfly weed now? Or like butterfly plant, all that stuff instead of using milkweed? Yes, it's, it's a better use of the word because uh, weed has become a problem. And uh, there are actually some um, cities and other jurisdictions around that don't allow you to plant it in your yard or in certain places because it's it's seen as a weed. Well, it's it's more than a weed. It's it's really actually a, a native that's been here all along. Um, it's rebranding, yes. And most of the butterfly weed that you'll see is the orange butterfly milkweed, and uh, that's the one that I'm I'm saying is probably a better choice because um, it doesn't invade and take off like the others. Um, so when providing for pollinators as well, we want to remember the monarchs, but also remember they have some other friends like all of our uh, native bees and uh, um, everything else that's struggling right now. Um, it's, I mean, even uh, um, ants and, and things like that can uh, pollinate um, certain plants. So um, we are thankful that the monarchs are kind of the spokesperson, but um, it's, it's good that it gets people planting more uh, natives and pollinators, but we got to remember we're doing it for more than just those. Um, the image on the right is uh, um, some bees on some coneflower at the uh, um, city park planting last year. And this is, uh, a little note, this is a 
purple coneflower, and I would suggest using pale purple coneflower instead. Um, it's more native than the, uh, the purple coneflower, um, provides some of that same color and everything, and it's more reliable and it lives a little bit longer as well. Um, but this was a transplant, so uh, and they're beautiful in themselves. Um, caution with cultivars of these pollinator species. So you see in the middle there, it's a white coneflower. Um, the white doesn't attract the pollinators in the same way as the purple. Um, purple and some of the other colorings and um, some of the stuff humans can't see um, guide those pollinators in. And uh, when you change or have a cultivar that really goes far away from the original color, a lot of times that will provide those same benefits. Um, they're beautiful though. That's actually, those white ones are in my yard. So um, I'm not saying don't plant them, but just know if you're planting them, you're probably not planting them for the pollinators. And then we also want to remember that uh, um, uh, annuals are great pollinator um, plants as well. So we can use things like zinnias that the uh, monarch is on there um, to help uh, kind of give the fuel that, uh, that gets those um, species through the fall. Um, other things like uh, Mexican sunflower work really nice in the fall too. Um, do we have uh, to provide that seasonal buffet, as I word it there? Um, and remember that some of those aggressive species uh, might want to use something else instead. Yes? So for the zinnias and the um, Mexican sunflowers, when, when's the best time to plant those? Uh, Any time here soon. Um, you can probably plant them just from seed right around now. Um, I planted some Mexican sunflowers at home last year, and it was late. It was probably the end of May, and uh, they were uh, they were probably eight foot tall by the end of summer, and had stalks that were almost woody. So they grow really fast once they get started. Um, you can go and buy them. Well, you can't find Mexican sunflowers in most uh, um, greenhouses because they don't they don't have a good shelf life. They get leggy and they're more of a back of the garden thing. But um, zinnias, you can find them started around now too. Um, it's a little bit of a different year. It's a little bit earlier than most uh, with spring, but um, I'd say fairly soon here. They're both a little more warm season, but um, May 10th is usually our average last um, frost. So still a little bit of caution with that. Um, so I guess moving on then to uh, designing with diversity, um, I guess are you guys planning on planting a tree this spring at all? Um, so when you go to the nursery, you have these uh, bigger long rows of trees or even at uh, um, a landscaping place like I would say landscaping here or Earl May, um, you'll see a lot of trees um, on the lot, but they're not all really creative equal in my mind. Uh, you have a lot of them that everyone's planting um, and you may want to keep up with the neighbors and have that beautiful fall color just like they do, but um, we should uh, think about um, some other plants that do the same thing instead of uh, putting in another uh, um, autumn blaze maple or whatever the new cultivar is this year. Um, so I guess that kind of spoils the next one a bit, but uh, which one of these would you choose in that instance? So you have a red maple and you have a black gum. Both have great fall color. Um, one's a little more orange, the other one's more red. Um, black gums can be just about any color though, um, and they're usually pretty vibrant, whatever they are. That tree there itself has probably five different colors on it right now. Um, so uh, you have these two choices. They both grow in pretty much the same environments. They can both take some drought. They can both take wet conditions. Um, but the maples are everywhere. You can see in that image, uh, just about everyone on that street you can see going down the, the road has one. So um, that's a concern um, uh, moving into the future if we're uh, getting too um, um, reliant on one species over another. So I'd. Uh, um, I'd suggest going and asking if you're looking for a tree, some of the uh, um, professionals around at the garden centers or, or nursery professionals, what they would plant. And it's usually not the maple, it's usually something that's a little more unique. And if you plant something unique, your yard can actually be the one that other people see and like, hey, what is that? And then start to um, hopefully not over plant, but uh, um, at least plant a few more of these species that aren't used as much. So when thinking about designing with diversity, it's something that we should have been doing a long time ago. Um, 
the what's called the five percent rule or the five to ten percent rule um, of uh, planting uh, diversity of plants. So no more than five to ten percent of a species, um, uh, no more than ten percent of a genus uh, within. Uh, I'm going to say the urban forest as a whole, or at least on your your neighborhood scale, if you think of it that way. Um, and we want to look more at uh, past that, um, looking at the genus level, but also the family level. Um, you have plants that, uh, like unfortunately, the beautiful oaks we have around, they have relatives on almost every continent. So the um, uh, the future for them is a little bit more shaky. You have pests that can come from multiple different places in the globalized world we have now. Um, so we want to pay attention to that. I'm not saying don't plant oaks because they're great, um, but uh, um, we want to uh, not overplant them at the same time. So keeping those uh, numbers to that percentage, you don't have as many trees all in the line. Um, the, the pest can't spread as quickly. Also, if a pest does come, you're not left with streets that are completely clear cut. So you can see these images here. First, the uh, big one on the right is the um, American chestnut. That was the first one to suffer a pretty much complete loss. Um, uh, and then you had the uh, um, American elm in the middle. And uh, I don't even remember the grand streets lined with elm very much. Uh, um, so they've been you know, gone for quite a while. There's still a few around um, that it, uh, escaped the infestations of uh, Dutch elm disease. Um, but then on the left there, we have what we're currently dealing with, and that's uh, um, ash trees. That's probably green ash, but our white ash are, are affected as well. And then now we're starting to see other things like uh, um, white fringe tree, which not even the same genus that are being affected by the, the emerald ash borer. So um, we want to be careful, uh, again, with what we plant. Um, in Iowa City, we're fairly uh, lucky. We only have approximately 12% uh, ash in our, on our street um, right-of-ways. Um, that doesn't include uh, what homeowners have, so there's, there's probably a higher percentage when you include that. Um, but things like looking back at the, the maples and why not to plant those right now, I talked about before, we have a, almost 25% maples on our street trees. Um, so if we uh, continue to add to that number, if something uh, unfortunately would come through that similar with the ash to affect the maples, we'd be in quite a bit of trouble because that's, that's a large percentage of our trees and uh, a large percentage of our valuable trees in the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. So are those cultivars that are resistant, they finally get out on the market, so yep. are they to Yeah, they'd be crosses of some sort. They've, they've crossed some with Chinese varieties, and then they have, um, they've done some breeding with, uh, um, that has a lot of the Americans still in there. Yeah. Um, so they're doing really well with the elms to bring them back. Um, and uh, I'd say go ahead and plant any of those. They're, um, they've been proven now over the last 10 to 12 years or so. Um, okay, kind of jumping on here. Um, do either of you uh, enjoy uh, weeding? <laughs> I kind of enjoy weeding, um, but uh, a lot of people don't. So this little tool here is one of my favorites. You can dig them out by the roots. Um, but uh, a lot of people don't, and, uh, and a lot of people develop their home garden, they, it looks great when they plant it, and then you know a month or two later, all the weeds start to come in, and they um, sometimes realize they've been off a little more than they can chew. Um, and uh, myself included, sometimes I like plant big projects, and then we have all the weeding to do. But uh, um, we can do a couple of things to help with that. Um, so many people rely on uh, uh, mulch as a main solution to limiting weeds. Um, Mulch is great, but I don't think mulch is that beautiful. Um, it, it looks okay, but um, a colorful plant uh, would look a lot better in most instances. Um, so by just using mulch to limit weeds, um, we're kind of uh, limiting our, our aesthetic uh, possibilities. Um, and also, um, while it limits the weeds, it can also keep some of your uh, nice uh, meandering or spreading perennials from spreading themselves. 
Um, if you don't do it right and let it get too far around the crown of the plants, it can cause disease and die back, and it, it can just be uh, bad news then. Um, I'm not saying a little bit of mulch is bad. It can help uh, mend the soil, but uh, um, the standard practice of three to four inches of mulch around everything, uh, um, perennials included, is probably not the best option. It's okay with shrubs in most instances, but um, if you think about even a forest, most trees don't grow in, uh, you know, uh, they grow in their own uh, decaying matter, but it's not chopped up wood mulch every single um, inch of the ground. So um, it's something to remember. There are other things we can do instead of using uh, so much mulch. And uh, it's one of those things we can use is just the plants themselves. Um, so all the plants, when you get them, come with a little tag, tell you how far to space them. Um, you can keep the tag if you want to know what the plant is, but I wouldn't follow those usually. Um, depending on the plant, some of the grasses and stuff like that, they're usually fairly close on. Um, your trees, that's usually pretty good, but when it comes to perennials, um, space them between, I mean, 12 and 18, maybe 20 inches, and they'll grow together. They'll compete a little bit, but you'll get a nice, um, this is the medians on Washington. It almost has a meadow-like look, but, uh, um, uh, composed metal look at the same time um, and this was at the end of the first year of planting and these plants were all plugs when they went in so you can see there now um, a few of those clumps you can define were probably as big as they would have been in a five gallon pot starting out so you can do a lot with um, with those plugs and these were all spaced at uh, between 16 and 18 inches when they went in. So um, ideally they would have been a little closer on a few of them, but um, you ought to um, examine your own budget and see what you can afford. But uh, um, you're not gonna be spending all the money on mulch and uh, you're gonna be saving your back some, uh, some hurt too from all the weeding. And I do have to say the first few months, uh, first couple of years, you have to stay on top of the weeding um, until these plants really establish and grow together. But after that you can uh, actually enjoy your garden a little bit more than just weeding all the time, unless of course you enjoy the weeding. So I guess uh, moving on to the next topic of, of planning, um, I'm gonna say the most important thing you can do is properly plan your garden, but then I'm gonna tell you that's also the worst thing you can do is plan every aspect. Um, that eliminates your chance of a lucky combination here or there that may become one of your favorite um, textures of one plant against another or color or um, you know you have a bloom here and then um, kind of with those alliums we saw earlier you can have the uh, more perennial allium um, blooming um, and you have the seed heads of the uh, the alliums that grow from the bulbs and you got that brown seed head with the same form and the nice pink or, or purple of the other and it creates this kind of cool um, I guess pattern through the the garden so um, things like that that can be happy accidents are are always kind of nice um, you should first off you should imagine your perfect garden that garden you might see in the magazine and kind of uh, understand that uh, um, that's there and if you have all the time in the world all the budget in the world you may be able to achieve that but uh, you can probably crumple up that that page from the magazine and throw it out and and do something that fits your time commitment um, your budget and and then plan accordingly it may be that you just do a smaller area instead of a larger one and then once you're comfortable taking care of that you can you can move on so a little bit about um, current planning um, uh, which you can see right outside here, um, our city hall project. This is a rendering of what the front will sort of look like. The plans changed a little bit, but this is the, the main idea um, just by the front door here. Um, uh, using uh, perennials to uh, soften the, uh, um, the building and um, create some, some color and interest. And uh, another nice thing about these perennials, and, and most of them are, um, they look nice throughout the winter. Um, I'd say wait until spring to cut most things back and uh, you'll have some height and interest all winter long. So this is that same plan. It's kind of the, the plan view of it. Um, the last view was uh, more of a perspective view and that's how I like to design. I like to think about how I'm looking at it. Um, might do a sketch or so or, or do a Photoshop like that last image and then um, 
uh, then I take that and transfer it to this view, um, the top-down view, um, to get the spacing of the plants and everything like that. You can see we're doing all along Washington Street and also across the street on the corner. Um, the big green uh, um, patches are where some turf's going back in. Um, it be nice for a farmer's market uh, time. There's a lot more seeding here, but then it's also full of perennials and uh, pollinators. So um, by the end of the summer, you should be able to go along and things should be establishing pretty well. Um, so it should uh, hopefully look look great um, come summertime here. And on the uh, couple of the areas, um, the bottom left of the uh, the um, image there um, where there's the, the yellow circle. Under that there's a bunch of sedges and that's uh, one perennial that's overlooked a lot. Um, sedges can do a lot. Um, uh, it's basically people think they look like grasses but um, they're, uh, they're a great plant and you can get sedges that grow in sun, shade, dry, wet. Uh, most of them grow best in wet but there are a few that work really well just about anywhere you might be planting them. We're also um, uh, going to be planting outside the rec center. Um, some of you probably realized last year or, or noticed that uh, we pulled out a bunch of the shrubs that were there, all kind of overgrown and uh, not very colorful. You know, no one really noticed them until maybe when we were pulling them out. Um, but uh, now you have uh, this um, rendering of that um, and this is how I thought of that design before I, I did the plan view again as well in, in this perspective view. And um, uh, just kind of the different heights and textures that we can get along there. And all of these will be good pollinator species as well, which will kind of link the two ends, the edible gardens on each end of the building together. Um, so it's we have food for us and food for the, the um, insects that are helping pollinate our plants in between. So um, that's something that's uh, that's important for them. Right now, actually, the uh, hawthorns out there, you can see the two, this is a fall image, but they're in bloom right now. So um, we'll have that, that white uh, flower in the spring too to complement uh, everything that um, would be new and popping up right about now. And this is the, the plan view of that. So you can see transferring from that, that original image to this, um, you kind of get, um, uh, this is more for the um, spacing uh, than anything else in, in the way I design. Some people start with this, which is fine, but um, I guess you're going to design your own garden. You can, uh, and you feel comfortable doing it yourself, you can choose whatever way works best for you. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it can be a quick sketch um, if you, if you um, want, and doesn't have to be anything too fancy. So you can see in here we have a um, couple areas that this is, um, uh, if you're looking at the building, this is in two pieces. So um, you have the, the top would be on the north side of the main entrance and the bottom here would be on the south side of the main entrance off of uh, Gilbert Street. Um, carrying some of the same plants all throughout, uh, some of the, uh, uh, something as simple as a hosta in the shade to um, a lot of grasses and other things, uh, um, other perennials and, and textural, things with textural quality and then pops of color throughout. And then kind of the, the last thing here is um, all of those things are great and we like things to look good through the growing season, but we have to remember what things are going to look like in winter. So these are a couple examples of uh, winter pots um, that can kind of complement uh, other perennial landscapes as well. The perennial landscapes, like I said, you can leave things up throughout the summer and it, uh, or throughout the winter and uh, carry it over until spring. So you have some of that heightened texture, but also we have these pots sitting open. Uh, why not add things like, you know, a conifer to it? These were pot and pot conifers there and we'll be replanting these soon. So they kind of get a, a second life um, as well. So they're used all winter and, and can be used again. And everything around the base of those and everything in the uh, this other pot by the uh, lake at, uh, and the lodge at Terry Trueblood Recreation Area, um, all of that was essentially free. Came from the prairie right there. Um, cuttings, you can uh, find different textures uh, just like you would in um, you know a flower arrangement or any even in your perennial arrangements, uh, um, creating that color and texture and, and kind of making it even brighter throughout the, the winter season. 
And then this is uh, this is one of my little luck things. I had never placed. Uh, um, this is Millennium Allium next to um, Autumn Joy Sedum before, and uh, throughout the year they both change um, as they go. But I really like the difference in texture with the uh, um, coarse uh, um, leaf texture of the um, um, Autumn Joy Sedum next to the. Um, uh, Millennium Allium or that, that fine texture and they both kind of have that globular uh, um, flower structure on top and they bloom at different times um, and then you can kind of see in the top left in the back there is a uh, um, one of the remaining uh, um, dried up seed heads of a, one of the bulb alliums in the corner so um, and that's that same theme and texture all throughout but adding different colors and and different uh it's different textures on the um the the leaf level but you have similar shapes and form and texture at the the flowering level so um if you have an extra plant stick it somewhere and and see um, and along with that don't just go and buy one of everything at the store i know it's tempting this time of year and i'll, I'll do the same sometimes but you want four or five ten or more of, of each plant so you can uh, really carry those themes throughout the garden um, as you go and this uh this millennium allium here is is real nice and it can be mixed with uh, another allium i really like that's um, summer beauty allium and they have a slightly different bloom time and a little bit different color so it really extends your your bloom out um, if you can find this one the summer beauty is easier to find than the millennium but um other than that um there's my contact info um if you have any questions you're Always free to free to contact me and uh, um, uh, within Parks and Rec. So we do uh, we do all of the stuff out in the parks, but um, all the stuff downtown as well, and a little bit of everywhere. So we're all, we're always happy to help anyone out. Anyone having questions? Or? Best time to plant your allergies. Uh, right now, pretty much. Uh, I miss. If they're the bulb ones in the fall, but if they're the uh, the other ones, you'll find that the uh, um, on the lots right now. Um, I'd say we're a couple weeks earlier than I'd be really comfortable with, but uh, all of our plants for the um, project out front here are coming middle of uh, of May, so any time in May would be good. But honestly, any time, as long as you're keeping them watered throughout the season, you'll be you'll be fine. Um, second best time to plant is in fall, so. Um, uh, as long as it's a little bit uh, larger plant in fall um, and more established, they, they do better. I wouldn't plant as many plugs in the fall, but. If you want to plant a tree, you don't want to plant maple. Can we plant? Uh, I just uh, got one from my yard uh, yesterday, and it's uh, um, a yellow wood, um, something like that, something that um, a yellow wood is a uh, medium sized tree. Um, doesn't always reliably bloom, but it doesn't have to because that's not the only draw of it. But when it does bloom, it's got great white blooms. Um, the only downside of it is if we have a really bad ice storm, they're a little more prone to uh, splitting. But uh, if you find one with good good form, also like, uh, I mean, it's a totally different tree and I didn't have quite enough space for it, but uh, American Beach I saw on the lot the other day and I really liked that. Um, uh, Black gums are nice, and, and if you're wanting something a little bit more like a maple, um, I like all the both hornbeams, American and European, um, and hop hornbeam. Um, so uh, things that you may have heard of, but aren't going to be as as um, uh, on every street out there, I guess. That all. Right, thank you guys. Nice Thanks. Thanks.